not in prison. Everything we published has everything, everybody's names on it. In that study, which is available online, it's called Changing Minds, the Impact of College on Women in a Maximum Security Prison. In that study, we learned four big things. One is we learned that when you offer college in prison, the recidivism rates drop from 30% to 7% or 7.7%. So even a conservative Republican, you should pardon the expression, should think <laughs> that that's a great tax saver, right? We also learned that when you offer college in prison, there's peace in the prison. It changes the environment in the prison. Even correction officers who didn't like it and were mad about it because they couldn't afford college would say, at least at night they're reading and I know they're not coming back. We also discovered that college in prison is at least a two generation impact. You educate a mother, you educate her kids, her nieces and nephews, the other young people around her. And the fourth is that it was um, transformative for the lives of the individuals. I had never met people who said, I'm so glad I went to college and now I can pay taxes. Go figure. I never met people who said, the greatest impact of college is how I raise my babies. I never met children who said, my mother is such a pain now that she goes to college, all she wants to talk about is homework. We never met young people who could now say, my mom is upstate, she's going to college. Fast forward a few years, many of those women came out of prison, many men came out of prison, and we were granted and gifted the opportunity because of Ann Jacobs to look at what's the impact of college after prison. And what we discovered is that there are many obstacles to men and women entering college after prison. But what we also discovered that we could not have known from inside are the enormous gifts that formerly incarcerated students bring to college campuses that college campuses don't know they're bringing because they don't allow them to share their gifts. And so Alexis Halkovics, the brilliant doctoral student who facilitated this very large, very complicated, very ambitious project. We'll detail our findings, but I want to leave you with a quote from one of our co-researchers, Corey Green. After we started documenting all the gifts that formerly incarcerated students bring to college, the new generation of affirmative action, one might argue, the new diversity, he said, we do not embody risk, we embody hope. Alexis Halkovic. So first of all, I need to thank a whole bunch of people. Um, starting with, of course, my co-researchers, um, John Bay, <laughs> Leslie Camp Campbell, Desheen Evans, Shaka Gary, Andrew Corey Green, Mark Ramirez, Robert Riggs, Michael Taylor, Ray Taboo, and Anora Tajawi. Um, so there's a vast literature that identifies various benefits of college for people who've spent time in prison, including drastic reductions in recidivism rates, positive effects on income, civic engagement, family, and personal health. College in and after prison offers a singularly effective strategy for redeveloping individuals, families, and communities, reducing crime, and lightening the tax burden of incarceration. Juxtaposing these positive educational outcomes for those who've been to college in or after prison with the race and educational demographics of the incarcerated population, it is obvious that access to higher education not only disrupts the school to prison pipeline, but it creates a new realm of possibility for those who previously imagined no such possibility. Rates of incarceration are three to four times higher for those who didn't complete high school than for those who attended college regardless of whether they graduated. The rate of white men in prison with neither a high school diploma nor a GED is one in eight,
compared to one in three for black men, showing a drastic interaction effect between race and education for criminal justice outcomes. Considering the strong correlation between lack of education and likelihood to end up in prison, the idea of higher education as a facilitator for reentry constitutes a turnabout, connecting those who historically have not had access to education to college. Also, the racial demographics of the incarcerated population indicate that the inclusion of the new minority into colleges is a civil rights issue. And those with criminal justice histories should be viewed under the umbrella of diversity and welcomed into colleges. Um, our PAR team of 11 students conducted focus groups, transcribed and coded individual and focus group interviews, and wrote individual research papers. We conducted six focus groups with 37 people. Four of the focus groups were with experienced students, those who have attended college after prison, and two with prospective students in the process of applying to college after prison. The experienced students were recruited through community-based organizations and by word of mouth and included five with master's degrees, eight with bachelor's degrees, six in the process of completing their bachelor's and two pursuing associate's degrees. The average number of years served is 10.5. The prospective students are all participants in the New York City Justice Corps program. These prospective students had an average age of 21 and had all been released from jail or prison in the past 24 months. Four members of this group had high school diplomas and the other eight were unable to complete high school due to being incarcerated or in juvenile detention. Of these eight, six completed their GEDs while locked up and two completed the GED after getting out. Um, we started off, next. We started off each focus group by asking the participants to draw a map. The experienced students drew maps of their journey from prison to college, and the prospective students drew maps of their journeys to making the decision to apply to college. In addition, we asked participants to describe the networks of support that helped them get into and through college, and to discuss the gifts they bring to campus. Um, we analyzed 14 videotaped interviews of students and experts on college and the reentry process that were part of a documentary film project by Benet Rubenstein and Jeremy Robbins. The interviewees have varying experience with higher education, most of whom have completed or in pursuit of advanced degrees. The average amount of time spent in prison uh, is 13.8 years. Interviews were viewed, transcribed, and coded by individual co-researchers using codes that were collectively created by the whole group, research group team. Okay, um, yes, finding. The, um, through, through analysis of both interviews and focus groups, the research team identified four broad levels of analysis, specifically public policy, which includes probation and parole, anti-fraternizing, financial aid and housing, university policy, including admissions and diversity initiatives, social dynamics, um, family, faculty, and formerly incarcerated support, and psychological dynamics, including shifts in identity, sense of self, and stigma. It is important to note that none of these categories is discrete. For example, institutional factors, such as the admissions policy of having students check the box, assigns risk as well as stigma, which can affect the sense of self. To give a sense of the overall report, I will discuss findings addressing policy barriers, <coughs> navigating the stigma of college on the outside, um, and the positive consequences or the gifts. Yeah. As the Center for, Center for Community Alternatives has documented in their survey, um, which uh, Natalie talked about, 66% of colleges and universities ask applicants about their criminal justice histories on the application. Once this box has been checked, they're very likely to ask for additional information. As Letitia testified, not only did I have to give a letter for my parole officer, they wanted a narrative of the crime itself. It was like going in front of the parole board all over again. It was intrusive, it was degrading, and then they wanted my rap sheet. Other programs discourage applicants based on what they argue will be barriers to future employability. As Anora explained, I was applying for I was applying for clinical psychology programs and one, of, and one had a statement online that says, if you have a criminal record, you should reconsider applying for clinical psychology programs as you will not get an internship. We have no way of knowing how many people are deterred from applying to college after being in prison 
But we know from our, stu our study, from the people in our study, that these requests were discouraging and outside support was often enlisted to get through the process. <clears throat> Once in college, many participants talked about navigating the stigma of having a criminal record. Chango, who had challenges staying in college after getting out of prison, describes the palpable experience of holding the stigma of having a criminal justice history and entering the college classroom. Bearing the stigma is unique to attending college after being released from prison, whereas this does not exist in college in prison programs. As Gockman discussed, in context where there's a mix of those bearing a stigma and those who don't, the individuals bearing the stigma is often treated as an outsider. Reflecting this, cultures of college classrooms outside the prison system rarely invite students with criminal justice histories to share their experiences, leaving them too often to keep their past secret. I think that entering a classroom as a person who's formerly incarcerated, you automatically feel different. You feel that you, you are, you're different than everybody else and you do wonder about the other students, where they're at, and if they can actually tell that you're formerly incarcerated. It's like you wear it like an invisible coat. You feel it and you wonder if anyone else can see it and tell. Chango feels the weight of the invisible coat he's wearing that may or may not be seen by other students, indicating that he's unsure of where he stands when he enters the classroom. Feeling different is actually feeling unwelcome, hampering his ability to fully engage. Yes. Alvaro, who is finishing his MSW, indicated that he always reveals his criminal justice history to his classmates and often experiences indirect discrimination. I wish it was direct. If it is direct, I know where I stand. I never interacted with anyone who <coughs> directly discriminated against me. It's the body language that changed. Now you're sitting across the room or you lost my email address and we're working on a group project. While Alvaro takes a risk by openly disclosing his history and making his invisible coat visible, he isn't met with a straightforward response. His tactic of disclosure leaves him open to a type of subversive discrimination that he cannot predict or pr be protected against. While the unaddressed fear that drives the behavior of the cold classmates creates a scenario where trust cannot evolve and learning is shortchanged. Being able to establish trust, form friendships, and find mentors aren't simply fringe benefits to higher education. They're both a central part of the journey and essential to getting through it. Next. One of the most consistent attitudes that we heard across the various narratives was the need to do more. This personal commitment is a benefit to universities, families, and communities where students with criminal justice histories focus their efforts. Alvaro explains how this need to do more permeates through all of the roles that he holds in his life. A lot of people who are formerly incarcerated who go into human services have a deep sense of this is not enough. So I'm working as a case manager and helping people, but that's not enough. I'm a, member of, I'm a mentor for College Initiative and that's not enough. I volunteer at that spot on the weekends, that's not enough. I'm going for my case act, but that's not enough because they feel that I owe this to myself, I owe it to my family, I have an understanding of what my role and position is in society, in community, at local level, at my agency, in my family. Men and women who are formerly incarcerated, if they're on campus, are more than likely doing more than just being a student on that campus. As Alvaro has identified, these students bring perspectives of parenthood, financial obligations, community responsibility, educational aspirations, and imprisonment that develop an obligation to use their academic degrees to serve humanity. Overwhelmingly, <coughs> the students we spoke to enter disciplines focused on helping others, particularly vulnerable and underserved populations, many joining the human service fields because they have a drive to serve those society has dealt the worst hands. <coughs> Social responsibility is one of the primary values we identified, a gift that needs to be nurtured. Students with criminal justice histories bring their <coughs> knowledge to the academic community in the form of life experience. Borrowing from Linda Tuiwai Smith, who focusing on Maori exper um, experience has written on indigenous methodologies and indigenous knowledges. We refer to the knowledge that people with criminal justice histories bring from their life experience as lost knowledges. Several of the students pursuing advanced degrees in particular talked about situations in which this knowledge emerged. During a focus group, Ephraim, a research assistant with a BA in psychology, refers to the expert knowledge of those who've been in prison, which cannot be accessed by those without life experience. 
Alexis, you're interested in prisoner reentry. This is no harm and no disrespect. There are certain parts of, the, of prisoner reentry that you can't access, that people in this room can access. There are people who want to do studies to understand how people end up in prison. The psychology major, to Corey, there are certain people who would love to do psych research that they won't be able to gain access to the people that you can. You bring the quality of been there, done that, but also you can gain access and can theorize and analyze the data. Ephraim's quote highlights the importance of lived experience for developing complex understandings. Ephraim's response to me emphasizes how the combination of personal experience and academic training develops a more complete understanding that is both unique and valuable to academia in terms of connecting theory and practice, but also in gaining access to communities through common experiences and trust. Next. Bell Hooks' idea of radical inclusion demonstrates the potential for merging knowledge based on lived experience with academic knowledge. Radical inclusion combats the structural violence felt by those excluded by their pasts by creating value in this new space from which lost knowledges emerge while bringing together insiders and outsiders to form a common bond. In these examples, we see a silencing effect, a blocking out of difference and denial that this difference represents a significant part of our society. There is a partial acceptance that requires assimilation. While assimilation is better than exclusion, it is not the same as acceptance and forecloses the potential for radical inclusion. Colleges and universities are situated to be spaces where lost knowledges emerge. There are things that can be done to facilitate nurturing the development of this space. This starts with admitting students with criminal justice histories, but also requires faculty, students, and administrators to change the climate, creating a welcoming and respectful environment. If students are admitted but forced to stay in the closet, their classmates and teachers will not understand their unique experiences. This would be a missed opportunity. It is through sharing, it is through sharing that communities are built, and it is communities that can determine to make social change. For this reason, we urge the expansion of the diversity umbrella to include students with criminal justice histories, providing a supportive environment in which new identities can be forged and new potentials realized, and also for the enrichment of the university itself. And thanks, and of course, I have to thank Ann Jacobs, Bianca, the Prisoner Reentry Institute, Benet Rubenstein, Jeremy Roberts, and our project advisors, Doug Tompkins, Rick Curtis, Baz Greisinger, Michael Carey, Michael Pass, Ephraim Thompson, Crystal Rodriguez, Vivian Nixon, and Justice Bell. Thank that you. That was great. So did I lie? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Fancy, fancy. Um, so I hope we've had you know, an opportunity to really hear the, the importance of this issue, get a sense of why higher education is important, not just for the, the people in this room, but why it's important to think about, as, as everyone has said here, the new diversity, right? This idea that there are um, inherent gifts that opening up our idea and our concept of what diversity could mean and does mean in an academic setting has implications far beyond public safety, reducing recidivism, but actually has uh, an impact on a college, a university, multiple generations of families and communities. And so I, I think it's in that kind of frame that we want to open up the conversation to our three discussants. Um, we've heard from the, from the researchers. We want to open it up to our three discussants to kind of give feedback on what we've heard here today and also add a little bit from your perspective in the work that you're doing um, with regard to this issue. So we'll turn it over to Alan and we'll do one, two, three. Up there just Whichever right you feel more comfortable. Probably yeah, up there. Up there. People, people, can, people can see you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I'll do better standing as a, as a lawyer and advocate, <laughs> um, and, and much less as a researcher. He um, does great research. <laughs> I'm, I'm so pleased to uh, review um, these two wonderful um, contributions to the field. 
Um, the water's great. Jump on in. <laughs> to all of you. Um, these are among the, the very few, but growing number of tools that we have to fight what is a very important and deadly struggle to accomplish what I think we can accomplish in framing equal access to higher education as a human right. I want to make four points. One will take a, a few minutes. Um, it, it, it kind of springboards off of the initial work that we did in, in only a few years in looking at the devastating effects of criminal history screening it was as recently as, as 2010 that we began to get some of the survey data back um, and learned how greatly the use of criminal history screening in the United States in the admissions process had proliferated. So, as you saw, about two-thirds of all colleges and universities in the United States engage in some form of criminal background history collection, or another way of saying it is one-third do not and haven't collapsed. The initial concern um, was that colleges were using this criminal history screening to deny admissions um, to applicants on the false premise that it would make college campuses more safe. And that our other concern was that criminal history screening, because of the disproportionality in the criminal justice system, would disproportionately impact college applicants of color. We've come a ways since then in identifying how serious this problem is. What's now emerging is, is a more clear picture of uh, the devastation. The number of men and women who are turned away from colleges because they are rejected or screened out because of their criminal history record pales in comparison to the number who are turned away um, by a de facto process. And uh, by de facto, I mean that there are two factors in play, one of which is the chilling effect of simply asking the question. Many applicants read that question and assume this is not being asked to include me, but to exclude me. Nobody likes to get kicked in the teeth. We all know that intuitively, and you stop filling out the application. That's chilling. The second, and I, and I don't even know which is the heavier, because it, it's hard to measure the chilling effect. How do you count the number of applications that don't even get filed, that the person doesn't get past the third question on the application, and the placement, actually, and let me comment on that. The placement of the criminal history question is an interesting one. Um, on some applications, you find it right after the question, what is your race? <laughs> Chilling. So, but the second, and, and I want to identify because it's some work that we're now just beginning to scratch the surface of, but it's important and, and it underscores how deep this runs. And, and that is what I refer to I'll try and come up with a better term, but it, what I refer to as the attrition rate in completing the supplemental requirements imposed by colleges once you've checked the box. So we can't count those who are chilled and don't ever fill out the application, but we can, and we intend to collect the data on what occurs from the time that you check the box to the time that the application is complete? And, and uh, in, in uh, a wonderful um, and, and, and short white paper done by one of the co-authors of, of this study, 
um, Corey Green. Um, he, he helps frame it as when you ask this question, there's the perspective of the applicant, there's the perspective of the institution. From the perspective of the applicant, and just a perfect way to say it, does it mean please stop filling out the application because you've been spotted? Or from the perspective of the institution, does it mean even if you are qualified for academic enrollment, we do not want your kind empowered by learning? Far-fetched? Think again. One of the leading proponents, leading proponents of using criminal background checks. And I'm not talking about check the box. I'm talking about proponents of criminal background checks for every applicant. Darby Dickerson is the dean of the Texas Tech University School of Law, who should know better. She concluded a lengthy article written for the National Association of College and University Attorneys with the ominous rationale by requiring criminal background checks of all admitted students, colleges will send a message about the type of students that they want. Let me just finish my remarks on this first point just to say this. What we've found is not only that these supplemental requirements, not only are they daunting, difficult, and reminiscent of a trip to the parole board, in some instances, they are literally impossible to complete. Documents are asked for that do not exist by name. Processes are asked to be followed that departments within the state cannot and will not follow. So what we found 